We have arrived at the last excavation encampment. My men have secured the facility, and we are beginning our search for survivors. My lord, the excavation team is nowhere to be found. The equipment is also missing. This expedition was to recover some incredibly dangerous archaeotech, Sergeant. We must find out what happened to the excavation team, and where the artifact is now. Welcome back to the Forge of Sagas. In today's episode of Terrain Essentials, we're going to be taking another step towards finishing our red versus blue themed skirmish level terrain board. Today we're going to be building four different types of barricades, military fencing, check hedgehogs, dragon's teeth, and jersey barriers. So without further ado, let's get started. The first project we're going to address is the military fencing. So our key components to make sure we capture this image is our upright fence posts, our chain link fence, and then these angled pieces at the top which are holding barbed wire to keep out intruders. Now we're going to start with these wooden dowel rods. You can get them at whatever thickness you like, but the key thing we need to figure out is how tall we want this fence to be. So for that I'm going to use a model to test it. This is a Skatari Vanguard I'm putting together for my dark mech, and we can see he's about a little over an inch tall. But I also want this fence to be big enough to keep vehicles out. So I grab this Chaos Armager that I've got and I find out, okay, I thought the three inches was good for infantry, but it's not gonna look so good when it's scaled compared to vehicles. So, move them down an inch at four inches and our fence is gonna be properly scaled for both infantry and vehicles. You can obviously play with that depending on your setting, but that's what I decided to go with. One of the best things about owning a cutting mat with measurements already on it is that you don't have to break out your ruler every time you want to measure something. You can just count squares. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to mark off a four inch section. The other reason I chose four inches for the length was because it was something I knew models could move over. Again, thinking about what I said in my philosophy video, terrain should be interactive, and in wargaming, that means considering average movement for units. 6 inches is the movement for Warhammer, so a 4 inch fence means it'll take 4 inches up, so it gives them 1 inch on either side. You can obviously adapt this height to not only the scale of your game, but also the rules to make sure that your terrain is interactive for your game system. Once you've got your sections marked off, all you have to do is come in with your hobby saw and cut away at it. You want to be really nice and gentle at first, just give it a couple of scrapes to establish a nice groove for your saw to sit in, then you can start cutting through the whole thing. Remember to take some sandpaper and sand each end flat. This is going to create a better contact point for our glue when we start to assemble the fence. If you ever end up damaging one of your dowel rods, I don't really remember how this one happened, I'm doing this voiceover in post. You can take a saw blade and cut it at an angle to represent a broken fence post. This might be somewhere where maybe an artillery shell or someone came through and chopped up part of the fence. So you can use that to add a little bit of diversity to your terrain so that your fence isn't always 100% uniform. And you get to still save a component that you otherwise would have had to throw away. Next we're going to create the slanted portion where our barbed wire is going to attach. Again I'm using the grid on my cutting mat to just create a nice angled feel for something that'll look good at a 45 degree angle. Once you've cut all your segments, I turned again to using my cutting mat because they had already had this 45 degree angle. So I just lined up the tip of my dowel with the 45 line, and then I just cut it out with my saw. Again, little drags to start, establish a groove, and then saw through. As with the first set of dowel rods we made, we want to come in and sand this, especially the angled portion, because that's what's going to connect to our main fence post. Now that we have both pieces, we're going to grab some Eileen's Tacky Glue to assemble them. Just glue the angle that's the 45 cut down to any end of your main fence post. One thing you'll notice is that there'll be a slight gap between the front of the vertical fence post and the bottom of that 45 degree angle cut. Don't worry about this extra space, we're going to fill that in in just a second. For our fencing, we're going to use this cross stitch mesh, also known as granny grading. So, I'm going to measure out 6 inch lengths of fencing because that's how far I want my fence posts to be apart. You can make longer or shorter segments depending on how you feel, but I used the measurements on my cutting board to figure out, okay, where was the first flat place where I could get a six inch section and then I trimmed it with my knife to get rid of that triangle. I used one of my fence posts to decide how much of a gap I wanted at the bottom of the fence. I ended up settling on about a quarter of an inch, you know. You can play around with it as you like, but a quarter of an inch was good for me, so I marked where that was with my knife and I cut it out. 
could also, again, use the rulers on your cutting mats or just a regular ruler, whatever it is you like to make your measurements with. Just make sure that you take your time making these cuts because you need them to be flat all the way along the fence line. Once your fence is cut out, we're going to attach that using some Eileen's tacky glue. Now you can see here that the width of the actual cross stitch mesh fills in perfectly that gap that we left at the top with the wooden dowel rod with that 45 degree cut. Now I'm going to add one fence post to each end, but you could also choose to add one in the middle of the length, and you could always go with shorter lengths of fencing if you want, or you could go longer. I chose 6 inches because it was a nice happy medium between something like a foot or cutting down to like really small 3 inch lengths of fence. 6 inches is going to look good on any table, you can use it in a variety of different ways, it's nice and modular, and I think it's going to be a good fit for both our skirmish table that we're building now and bigger tables to come. To keep my fence standing upright, I cut these 1 inch by 1 half inch supports. They're just simple and made out of chipboard, and I just came in and marked the middle of them as a guide for when I glued them to the bottom of the fence post. The reason I'm gluing it this way instead of creating a larger, possibly more stable base for these is that I wanted them to be really modular and useful on any board. If we created a full base out of MDF or even just chipboard, we'd have to flog the entire underside of the fence and then it would force us to only be use it on, say, my grassy board, which we're doing for the red versus blue project. Then I would have to make an entire another set for my tundra board, another set for a desert board, and the process frankly would just get repetitive. So by putting them on these little stands instead, I can use them on any board. You may have to prop them up while the glue dries using some paint bottles, glue bottles, whatever it is you've got, but this will expand the usage of your terrain and you'll have to build less of it overall, saving you some time and resources. If you want to create a corner piece for your fence, just glue the fence post in at a 45 degree angle instead of gluing it straight on. Then take another piece of plastic fencing and glue it on a right angle on the other side. One of the nice things you can do with the corner piece is reuse some of the scrap from earlier. As long as it's still the right height for your fencing, you can create a broken edge to the fence where maybe an artillery shell has hit the fence and exploded a section of it. Here you can express your creative destruction by tearing into it with your knife, create some holes, some ragged edges, anything to give it that feel that a battle was fought here. The last thing we need to do is to make some barbed wire that we're gonna sit on those 45 degree angle pieces. So I took three 18 inch lengths of wire for one section of fencing that's six inches long. That way I can get three different sections of barbed wire and create this triple layer. Clamped it down at one end of my table and began turning the other end with a set of needle nose pliers. Do not do it this way. This was horrendously inefficient. So what I did after this, and I realized this is gonna take me days, I grabbed a power drill. Just spin down until it locks around the three pieces of wire, and then with a very light pull on the trigger, wind it up until it's taut throughout. Once you've made your wire, we're going to attach it using super glue. This is gonna give us a quicker bond that's not gonna allow the wire to slide around. So just add a generous amount to wherever you wanna stick the end of the wire, and gently place the wire inside the super glue. It can be a little tricky, but just be patient, and in no time at all, you'll have all three lengths attached, and it'll look like you've got a nice string of barbed wire over the top of the fence. The next piece of terrain we're going to look at is called the Czech Hedgehog. These were developed during World War II and were used to restrict the movement of enemy tanks. On your battlefield, they can be used as a way to delineate areas where enemy vehicles are not allowed to move. And they can also provide cover to your infantrymen because they're made of metal. They might actually deflect bullets or absorb laser rounds. So now you have a terrain piece that is not only interactive because it has rules, but is also intuitive into the fact that those rules are fairly obvious. I cut a piece of chipboard so that it would be six inches long, and then I marked off quarter inch segments. Here I'm using the ruler that is built into my paper slicer. I got this thing for $2 at a garage sale. And if you can keep an eye out for one, they're really nice when you need to repeatedly cut pieces of cardboard at an even length. We're going to take two 6 inch lengths and cut them into 2 inch segments. Then we're going to take some Eileen's tacky glue and apply it to the edge of one of them and combine them together to make an L shaped bracket. This is the same shape we saw in the reference image and we're going to create 3 of these to form the components of our Czech Hedgehog. Once we have all three pieces assembled, I'm gonna use a ruler to just give myself a rough estimate of where the middle of each of them is so that I can assemble them easily. 
put a dab of glue and apply two of them together to form kind of an X frame. And then once I'm ready and the glue is basically set, I'm gonna grab a third one, size it up, apply a dab of glue to both of them where the pieces are going to connect and add in that third point. You might need to make some slight adjustments as the pieces can slide around a little bit. But at the end of the day, here you have it. Nice, easy terrain piece with nothing but cardboard and glue. I painted the check hedgehogs and the fencing from the previous section the same way, so I figured I'd talk about both of them together. I gave each piece two layers of a cheap metallic primer just to make sure I had a nice base coat, and then I came in with the brown wash from Black Magic Crafts to give them a little bit of aging and weathering. I'll link his video in the description so that you can recreate the washes. He does a really great job with it, great channel. So I did it this way for these terrain pieces because I wanted them again to be very universal. But if you want to add more detail to yours, you know, maybe go with a little more of a rusty, really old look, you could go with a burnt umber base coat and then a metallic dry brush. That's the same thing that I did in my demonic smelter video. Or you could take some hints from the crater video and add in some atmospherics that are relevant to your particular setting, be that a little bit of grass flocking, a little bit of snow, a little bit of sand, a little bit of dirt, mud, whatever. However, there are two main benefits to using a more universal paint job. The first is that this is something you will only have to make once, no matter how many different types of boards that you have. The second benefit is that it takes up less space because you only have to build it once. So instead of having three shelves dedicated to just chain link fencing, you could have space to put more models on, or you could fill that space with a nice new terrain piece. Maybe, I don't know, a two foot by two foot demonic smelter that you could easily find a YouTube tutorial on how to make. I'm just saying, the possibilities are endless. The final two pieces of terrain we're going to talk about are Dragon's Teeth and Jersey Barriers. Dragon's Teeth are another anti-tank fortification that were developed during World War II. Meanwhile, Jersey barriers are essentially a concrete barricade that are used in a variety of ways today. They're used in highway construction to protect workers, by police to control the movement of crowds, and by militaries to secure various checkpoints in other places. So they should have a wide application across your gaming tables to represent different things. And the last nice thing about them, they're both made of concrete, and we're going to make them both at the same time, with the help of a very special tool. And that tool is the plastic packaging that plants come in from the hardware store or wherever it is you get your potted plants for the summer. We can already see that here are dragon's teeth, and the top ridge in the center is going to make a nice jersey barricade. Now we could just chop up these pieces of plastic and use them as the terrain, but I wanted to make this a little more replicatable. So what we can do instead is flip this piece over, and then we're going to see that we can use this as a concrete mold, letting us easily mass produce these simple pieces. To help subdivide the interior so I didn't have to make one massive concrete barrier and then saw it apart or try and otherwise break it, I grabbed a piece of chipboard. To get the height I wanted, which was about waist height, was about an inch for Warhammer 40k models, but again, work to your scale. I then trimmed it so that it would fit nicely inside the slanting nature of our concrete mold. Now, one sidebar that I found out while doing this, you can use these chipboard pieces, but they will stick to the concrete, it's one of the few things that will. Instead, I would recommend using blister pack plastic or maybe even slicing off one of the dragon's teeth shapes that you see on this piece already and using that instead. No matter what material you end up deciding to use, once you've got it nicely sized up, take your hot glue gun on the high temperature setting if you're using a dual temperature gun and apply a bead of hot glue all around the edges of the piece where they're going to connect. I used that set of needle nose pliers so that I could keep my fingers away from the hot glue and prevent myself from being burned. Once you're ready, just take your end cap and carefully work it down, keeping it at the same angle as the mold. This is not only going to help prevent the concrete from moving around, but it's going to remind you of the height that you need to pour it to. Next we're just going to take some regular concrete, mix it up, and pour it down into the mold. The water to particulate ratio may be different depending on where you live or what kind of concrete you've purchased, but make sure it's real concrete. I tried doing it with some leftovers we had around the house that I thought was concrete, but was actually a vinyl patch for concrete, and that did not set at all. It really does need to be concrete. So just pour it in and tamp it down. You don't want any air bubbles in there, so you can use either your spatula 
or the end of a wooden dowel rod, a little sponge, whatever it is that you've got on hand to really compact this and make sure you've got a nice firm frame. All that's left to do is let the concrete set. Reference your directions to find out exactly how long that is. Mine took about five hours, I think. When you're taking it out, you want to be careful not to rip the plastic at all. This stuff is pretty thin, so you don't have to pull it apart much. Just give it a little jiggle, tap it on the top, and it'll come right out. Now, when it pops out, you might have just a little bit of a lip on the concrete where it's stuck to the wall of the mold, but you can either break that off with a chisel, your hands, or if they're a little bit thicker, you can grab a big old metal file. Just work it back and forth until you have a nice flat bottom so that your concrete will sit nicely on the tabletop. Now the best thing about this is we're done. We don't have to paint this to make it look like concrete because it already looks like concrete because you guessed it, it really is made of concrete. You could add a wash to it to give it some weathering, maybe attack it with a drill or something else to give it some bullet holes to make it look a little more battle torn. But if you don't want to, you can easily take these, drop them right on the tabletop, and it'll look perfectly fine. Now it's time for a little showcase so that you can see how these builds will look on your tabletop. Using the scenario from the video's introduction, we can see how all of these different builds can be combined to create a fortified area on your tabletop. With relatively basic techniques and inexpensive materials, we've created a terrain that's not only visually appealing on the tabletop, but also meets all of the three eyes for terrain that I established back in my terrain building philosophy video. With that completed, we can put another check in the box towards our skirmish level red versus blue board. We still have that big vehicle build coming up at the end, so leave a comment below for which vehicle from the series you'd like to see me build as the final piece for our skirmish level terrain board. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date on not only the red versus blue board, but all the other terrain building and kit bashing projects we do here at the Forge of Sagas. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again the next time we ignite the Forge of Sagas.